Okay, scripture is short today, <clears throat> so I'm going to let you sit. Actually, started out with the intention of going through verse 29, and this was to be the introduction, but when the introduction gets that long, you got to make it two sermons. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I think this will be a blessing to you. The song really was perfect for the sermon. We didn't collaborate, but really perfect. I want to dwell on this topic today because of the beauty of Jesus. You know, if, if we can learn to love him more, appreciate him more, that's probably our greatest need. And it's one of, he's one of those topics in the scripture that's just hard to really uh, talk about adequately. He's so much more than our words can contain. So this is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 through 23. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as Adam, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. And let's pray together. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> When I, when I think of the way you love us to give us your son and how wonderful he is, at times it's overwhelming. And I just pray that you'd help me to uh, preach adequately to encourage our hearts, to help us see you a little more clearly, to take joy in the resurrection. And may we truly have the hope that we need. In Christ's name we pray, amen. First fruits, what is that all about? This is something that's mentioned often in the scripture. It's in the Old Testament, in the observances of the law, and it's used as an illustration to talk about Christ and the resurrection. The repetition is there for a reason. <clears throat> it's a very important thing. It starts with these words. But now is Christ risen from the dead? and become the first fruits of them that slept. That means those who've died. Uh, they tended to talk in a little bit vague language sometimes when things were difficult topics. Um, the analogy of first fruits meant more to the people in those days than they would to us. It especially meant more to the Jews. Throughout their history, they had a festival every year uh, that was devoted to the first fruits because it was illustrative of important things in their faith. Um, the holiday would indicate God's blessing on their obedience. It would also be a reminder that if they weren't experiencing God's blessing, they needed to do something different. So it also gave them the opportunity to act in faith toward God as part of this celebration, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. The first fruits. Now, it would be easy to think of the word and just think that means apples and oranges and pears, but it had to do with everything that they grew uh, that was uh, edible and useful in an agrarian society. This was their source of food. It was their source of commerce. Um, would have been a big deal. So think of it as fruit, vegetables, grains, all those things. Not only was it an indicator of God's blessing, but it would also allow the people to sample and evaluate the harvest. What came in first was indicative of what would come. If it was a good beginning, then they could relax. If it was a poor beginning, it was likely in their case that uh, repentance was needed. Now, I don't want you to take that directly into, into modern times. God always has his purposes, but we can't always say because there's no rain or because there's difficulty, that's the judgment of God. 
God acted very directly with Israel. And all those illustrations about Israel are to help us understand how God works in our personal lives. So don't be upset with the farmers or think the farmers did anything wrong. That's not the point. Um, the first fruit would be a test of how substantial, how flavorful, how healthy, and how valuable the crop would be. They'd actually bring in the first of the harvest and they would prepare it how they were going to prepare it. They would sample it and they would compare it to other years and other times. They compared several things. Was, was it substantial? In other words, did it look like from what was growing and did it look like from what they gathered in their hands that there was a quantity of healthy looking fruit, vegetables, or grain? Did it look like the harvest was going to be good? Remember in those times, they didn't have all the science and all the things to keep track of. It was all visual and they had to figure it out. When I was a clothing salesman in Naperville, one of my customers was Max Armstrong. Anybody recognize that name, Max Armstrong? Max Armstrong did the farm report and he was one of the nicest guys I've ever been around. And that voice that you hear on the radio, that was not modulated by the radio. That was really his voice. And uh, we had a good time talking about farms and farming and farming communities. And sometimes we'd talk about the technology and we'd talk about the sandwich fair that he went to every year. And he knew about Sterling and um, he just, he knew it all and he was fun to talk to. Um, but he had a wealth of information even as a radio broadcaster that farmers in this time would not have had. No access. They had to kind of feel their way along. They had to look around. They had to trust God for everything. And uh, there was no insurance. There was no safety net. There was nothing. It was they and the elements and God. So, was it flavorful? Now, have you ever gone to the store and picked up a piece of fruit and oh my, it looked good. And you got it home and you bit it and it tasted bad. Did you care how many of those there were? No. You hoped that was the only one, especially if you brought a bag full of them. But it's important when you talk about something being fruitful, you want it to grow a lot of what it's growing, but you also want it to taste good and leave a good taste in your mouth. I remember when Jeffrey was in the Navy, he was stationed at Pearl Harbor in Honolulu and it, because we could stay in his military housing, we could afford to go over there one Christmas and we did. Stayed for uh, I think 11 or 12 days. Strange place around Christmas. I mean everywhere you go there's a picture of Santa Claus in a speedo skiing. Very unsettling as far as I was concerned. Um, but uh, the thing that was most remarkable to me, besides I love the ocean, but we got a pineapple at a roadside stand. He picked it off of the plant and he cut it and he gave us some of the pineapple. It was like I had never tasted a pineapple before. Same with papaya, same with mango. I don't know what happens by the time it gets here to the store, but trust me when I tell you, it's not the same. And if you can ever go to Hawaii, you should. And you should take me. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, so that's one of the real tests of a harvest. It is the plant delivering what you want it to deliver? If it delivers mass quantities of things that don't taste good, eh, it's no good. Like this lady, she got something in her salad that really is making her pucker up. Third, was it healthy? Was it a crop that would nourish the people? Or was it mixed with weeds, thistles, tares? Was it a good harvest? Was it really something that was going to feed the people? You know, Nowadays, there's going to be a rush to grow hemp so people can have CBD oil, and there's going to be a rush to grow marijuana because certainly we all need to be more impaired. 
And uh, <clears throat> sorry, just an opinion. Uh, but uh, that was important. The crop needed to be good for people. And fourth, was the crop valuable? Now, I'm asking, was it valuable in the sense of would there be enough to feed the people and would there be enough for them to use as a trading commodity? They needed a bountiful harvest. If there wasn't a bountiful harvest, then they would immediately have to go into uh, savers mode. They would have to protect their interests. They would have to store what they had. They would have to ration it. They'd have to be very careful. You see an example of that in the story of Joseph where they just knew that enough wasn't going to come. And so they couldn't just randomly act and depend on the government to provide for them. They had to protect their own interest. And by the way, that's a mentality that's really being lost today. We really need to make choices that protect our interests when risk is involved. We need to evaluate risk, look ahead. The Bible encourages us in a number of places to look ahead, see the evil, and avoid it. Not just go headlong into it and say, well, God, you need to fix this for me. The first fruit was also a promise of what was to come. If the first fruit was skimpy, if the first fruit was flavorless, then that's what the people could anticipate. It was a strong indicator of what they could anticipate for their personal economy ahead. Now, here's the illustration. The verse we read says Christ is the first fruit. Now, many things are written in the scripture to remind us of the magnificence of Christ. I can't do him justice. I really... Uh, of all the topics I preach on, it's probably the most intimidating to try to speak adequately about him. But if Christ is the first fruit, does he leave a good taste in your mouth? Yes. If you really know him, if you understand what he does, if you understand how much he loves, he leaves a good taste in your mouth. And who are we supposed to be like? Christ. So it naturally applies, right? We are supposed to leave a good taste in the mouths of others. This lady, she's excited about that apple. Uh, I like the green ones with a little salt. They don't know about you. I think that makes them better. But um, is Jesus substantial as the first fruit? Sure he is. He's more than enough. He's perfect in every way, even in those ways we don't understand. You know, I have conversations with people all the time. There, there are things in the world I don't understand, and I'm not pandering to anybody to say this, but I don't understand how uh, God allowed women to be so vulnerable in the world. I don't understand. I don't like it. Uh, I don't understand why uh, people needed to go for years without plumbing and running water. The disease and the things must have been rampant. I don't understand. But the bottom line is there comes a point where I have to put that away in my heart and say, the Lord is substantial. The Lord knows. The Lord has his purpose. And someday when we see him, we will not say, oh, okay, I can live with that. No, we're going to marvel at the wonder and wisdom of what he's done. Now, in relation to those things I can't explain, I don't know how that's going to happen. I just trust that it will. And preachers struggle with those difficult things just like you do. So we shouldn't pretend and be in denial as Christians Life presents us with a lot of hard challenges. But Jesus is what we need. Does Christ impact our health? Yes. I believe that's demonstrable. I won't go into a lot of detail, but 
even if you're only talking about the eternal. I said to Eileen this morning, I said, how are you, young lady? And she said, oh, you must be talking to Linda. I said, no, I'm talking to you. You're 87. What's 87 years to somebody who's going to live forever? You ever think about that? Oh, I'm getting old. Yeah, that's what they tell me. But I'm still 14 on the inside. I'm going to stay 14 on the inside. And when I go to heaven, I'll bet I'm 14. I don't know for sure. But talk about providing health benefits. And then you talk about things like the potential for joy, the potential for peace, the potential for hope. Christ is our first fruit. He provides more than the harvest of grain and fruit and vegetables ever could have. <laughs> Does Christ prove to be valuable? He's enough to take care of our needs. He's also enough to extend him to others. I have no fear to say to people, I know you're struggling. I know you're hurting. I know you have adversity. I know those things are very real. But the bottom line is that Jesus loves you. He has given himself for you. And he can provide comfort and hope and eternity for you. He's the first fruit. We've all had those fruits and vegetables and grains that are disappointing. We all know what that is to bite into something with hope and have it not be what we wanted. That will never happen with Christ. Eternity will continually reveal the wonder of who he is. Eternity will continually reveal the wonders of his love. Now here's, I think, an exciting question. If Jesus rising from among the dead makes him the first fruit, what should we anticipate from the dead in Christ? Don't be bashful. What? More fruit. What's the fruit? Who is the fruit? The dead in Christ. He's making the point. When you take the first fruit from the tomatoes, maybe the best part of summer, right? Some of you don't like them. I can't imagine that. Uh, when you take the first fruit from the tomatoes and they're really great, you want more tomatoes. You can just pick your favorite vegetable. Yesterday I had corn, carrots, beans, potatoes, and uh, <clears throat> a pig volunteered to share some of his bounty with me. But uh, <clears throat> this is the picture. Oh, hey, the first fruits, they're here. Uh, we got apples and oranges and all this stuff, and boy, it's all really good. And there was more coming. Christ rose from among the dead. There is more coming. The resurrection's not done because there's a gap. God restoring all things is not done because there's a gap. Jesus rose as the assurance that that was possible. We talked about that last week. Paul said to the Corinthians, how, how do you listen to us preach and and you believe in the resurrection of Christ, but you say there's no resurrection from the dead. This resurrection is proof. He is the first fruit. That means you can die and not live in fear of it. How about that? I don't know when Christ is going to return. I believe that he is. I'm surprised he hasn't done that already, quite honestly. But, you know, at 63, I keep looking at every, every day, I look at the obituaries, and every day there's somebody in the obituary younger than me, and I think, how can that be? I think the calendar must be wrong. I can't possibly be this old. But you know what? We sing at the end of the service. 
No fear in death. Because the reality, the hard, concrete reality, is that Christ rose and we shall rise. The first, first fruits were also celebrated because their choice was and their encouragement was to give to God first. And that's the lesson we always teach in relation to our personal giving. And that standard, you see it throughout the Bible. Remember Noah gets on the ark with all the animals, some of them by twos and some of them by what? Not all by twos. All the clean animals went by what? Sevens. If it was a clean animal, if it was a cow, they took seven. <clears throat> Apparently you didn't know that. They're on the ark for all that time. They get off the ark and they've got this limited number of animals. They're supposed to repopulate the earth. And the first thing Noah does is make sacrifice of an animal. That was faith, don't you think? I think I would have been tempted to say, wait, 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 wait. That's a ribeye over there. I don't have stand to rely on to, to breed more cows, so we've got to protect this nest egg we have. But he trusted, they tr he trusted God to give to God first. He trusted the faithfulness of God first. And that's what we encourage in our personal giving and generosity. You trust God to take care of you when you take care of him first. So that's what they did. And that was the encouragement of the Old Testament. They were to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all the fruit of all the trees year by year unto the house of the Lord. Now wait, they've got this initial harvest. They're supposed to bring it to the house of the Lord. Do you suppose there's anybody who was bent a little negative who might have said, well, what if we have a disaster? What if, what if, what if we have storms or locusts? Or what if, what if we have this? Or what if we have that? It took faith to bring their gift to God to be used in his house. And in Proverbs, the book of wisdom, we're reminded to honor the Lord with our substance and with the first fruit of all your increase. You know, most of the happiest Christians I know are people that learn to give to God first. And those who struggle the most are the ones who just wait and wait and wait and give God the leftovers. And Lord, if there's anything left over at the end of the month, I'll give to you. That's not how faith works. We're encouraged to give to support the work of God. This is not a selfish new Christian teaching. Okay? This is throughout the Old Testament. It's throughout the New Testament. Now, what does that mean? It's all about you? When we encourage generosity, whether it's toward us or whether it's toward someone in need, it's not about us as a church community. It's always about the individual. God is teaching individuals faith God is teaching individuals generosity. God is teaching people to give up selfishness. God is teaching people to be economical in the way they approach life, to make sure they make good use of their resources. It's an exercise of faith. What we do should push us a little bit. God wants us to exercise faith. And then, when our faith is challenged, and our habits are challenged, and our way of thinking and our way of doing things is different, God's work is supported as a byproduct, but that's not the first goal. The first goal is right there. God wants to build and strengthen you. The issue of fruit bearing and fruitfulness and being flavorful are, are ideas that are frequent in the scripture. And I'm just going to allude to a couple of them 
If you want to make your own Bible study out of this, you can. But this need to leave a good taste in people's mouths, that needs to be part of our thinking. We're supposed to be the salt of the earth. Why do we salt things? Because it reveals the flavor. The salt touches our tongue and it opens our sensory nerves, whatever they're called, and it helps us appreciate the flavor of the food more. We are that for people. We change their ability to appreciate who God is. If we pay attention to who we are. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. God wants us to be fruitful. And it just makes sense that if God wants us to be fruitful, he wants that fruit to taste good to those who have it. Then we know about the fruit of the Spirit. Those are attractive things. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Don't we wish we could somehow infect all of our politicians with those things? Inoculate would be a better word. Infect is the wrong word. They're already infected, I think. But... Then you think of, <clears throat> right off in Genesis 1, one of the very first commands God gives to people. God says to Adam and Eve, hey, I made you in my image. That means you're infinitely valuable no matter who you are or in what stage of life you are. I want you to be fruitful. I want you to produce those things you're designed to produce. And I want you to leave a good taste in people's mouths. Not a new idea, an old idea God keeps bringing forth to us. Be fruitful. Leave a good taste. Make people look forward to what you are going to bring next. Jesus is the first fruit. If it's true that you will not be disappointed in him, then you will not be disappointed in the resurrection. If you will not be disappointed in the resurrection, you will not be disappointed in heaven. God and his faithfulness will bring you no disappointment. This is just another angle with which we can look at Jesus. We can look at him as the king. We can look at him as a suffering servant. We can look at him in so many ways, the scripture reveals. But in this way, we're really reminded that there's something wonderful to look forward to. He's the first fruit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us from our hearts to have a new and greater appreciation for you. Help us to see the blessing that you are, and help us to be a blessing for others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.